Catherine, welcome. It's great to have you with us today. Before we begin and get very technical, could you perhaps give me a quick rundown of your own journey into biotech? Will do, Nick. I'm an avid listener of your podcast, so it's great to actually be able to speak with you today. My journey started, I did my PhD in biochemistry, like a lot of people who enter this industry. And then after that, I actually went to work for a life science reagents provider, Abcam, which to, mo- to people who work in the life science industry is now a global brand with, a, I think, a 2.5 billion market cap. When I joined, I joined as employee 35. So years and years ago, when that company was doing a scaling journey, which you could argue could be paralyzing what a cultivated meat companies are trying to do these days. That was a fantastic experience, scaling a lab straight out of PhD. Learned so much about the impact of quality and, re- and, and how important reproducibility is across the board in biotech. And after that, I actually took a little bit of a career break. I had tiny children, so I took a career break, did lots of marketing, business development, consultancy, all sorts of bits and bobs, worked with some really fun people. And then I went back into academia. Bit of a mad career choice, but absolutely wonderful. And I actually studied complex protein libraries, which are which parasites used to invade red blood cells. So trying to identify proteins involved with invasion of red blood cells, absolutely mad absolutely wonderful and it was while I was doing that that I was introduced to Marco Hooverman who's a structural biochemist in the University of Cambridge and he had a really mission-led drive to improve the quality of growth factors that were available to stem cell biologists he'd been involved with some of the pioneers of stem cell biology here in Cambridge and we were chatting and to cut a long story short, we found a QKine at the end of 2016 and we've been scaling ever since. So, mm-hmm. and so we're a specialist in growth factor manufacturers. It's what we do. We're protein biochemists. Um, we started initially looking, working with the biomedical sec, really looking at how to tackle some of the problems that that industry had with scaling cell manuf- stem cell based manufacturing for use in drug discovery pipelines. So really looking at removing animal components, better ways of scale, better performance of the growth factors. And and then there there was this really exciting emerging industry, sort of early uh, 2020 in the cultivated meat space. And a lot of the challenges and also a lot of the companies we were working with were also in the cell and agriculture field. Uh, So companies like Meetable, connected with BitBio here in Cambridge. So we sort of naturally segued to try and start helping some of those customers with their scaling challenge. And that's why today we're actually working with cultivated meat companies sort of across the world, trying to really help and support using our growth factor expertise. Mm-hmm. And, and how do you view your company's role in the global CELAG center, uh, sector? You're, I mean, you're a UK company, but you're definitely global in scale. Yes, we are. So we're still quite a small company, um, I'd say. So uh, we're about 30 people based in Cambridge. Um, what we sell to our growth, we have customers in over 33 countries actually worldwide. So we operate on the world stage. The science that we do as an industry is the same, irrespective of which country you're in. And our particular focus here is really on the more complex growth factors. So growth factors can be split really into two different categories. And we'll probably talk a little bit more in detail about this later. We have special expertise in the TGF beta family growth factors, which are incredibly complex proteins, very difficult to manage to manufacture with a a high degree of of quality and and bioactivity. And the other side of what we do here is we're very proactively trying to build out all the growth factors that this industry needs. So anyone in this group of this industry will know that there is very, very few growth factors available that are species specific. So, for instance, even simple things like bovine and porcine uh, EGF, which is one of the common growth factors, a lot of, lot of companies use them, it's only available in a human form. So what we're trying to do is to extend the availability of growth factors to really support that research base and the translation into media development in companies and use our core skills in optimising growth factors for better use in bioreactors and higher manufacturing yields to really really try and catalyze the development of the supply chain. Mm-hmm. 
So we're going to be focusing for the next 30 or so minutes on growth factors. As many of us will know, these are indispensable tools in cultivated meat production, enabling the replication of the biological processes that occur in living animals, allowing for the creation of meat without the need for traditional livestock farming. So let's get some basics out of the way, Catherine. Could you provide me with a layman's overview of the, the idiot's guide? I am the idiot in this case of what growth factors are and how they are used in cultivated meat production. Yeah, absolutely. So as you mentioned, Nick, these are naturally occurring proteins that in the human body, particularly during the development of early embryology, they're incredibly potent proteins that are secreted by cells to act on other cells to develop those tissues. And what's particularly relevant for this industry is because they are incredibly potent proteins, they're subject to a wide variety of regulation within within the animal. And the the sort of the the those control mechanisms that operate within the human body are not necessarily the same control mechanisms that you want to act within a bioreactor. Hmm. And these growth factors, they they bind onto receptors on the cell surface. And they give those cells a very carefully orchestrated set of signals to tell them to either proliferate, so to grow, so to, or increase biomass in, in this industry, or a set of signals that tells them to turn into a particular cell type. So, for instance, a muscle cell, or indeed to mature as a muscle cell. Mm -hmm. And what so, and then in the cultivated meat, or indeed in any sort of stem cell or primary cell culture conditions. What you do is you take these proteins, you mix them into the media, the liquid that the cells grow in, and you again use these proteins to give those cells instructions about what to do or to aid their survival. Mm -hmm. How, for instance, growth factors differ from other components used in the in the cell culture, such as the media or the scaffolds? Yeah, absolutely. So, so we all know that the 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 recombinant protein, which growth factors are element of the cell culture media constitutes a lot of cost in the media. So those recombinant proteins split into so what, what I call more the bulk proteins, so the albumins and transferins, um, and then the growth factors, which are the bioactive components, so the, the messengers within that media. And then the scaffold is really interesting. So the scaffold is also able to interact with the proteins that are in the media and the cells themselves. So, so the scaffold really underpins all of those interactions and it enables the cells to grow effectively in a, a bioreactor conditions. So it allows them to mimic being adhered onto a surface. While well, the growth factors are usually in the media, may associate with the scaffold and could be forced to associate with the scaffold, which is a really interesting area, to really give those, those cells messages about how to behave. Mm -hmm. In, in what ways can these these products that you're developing there at Qkind impact the scalability and cost effectiveness of cult meat, uh, cultivated meat production? We hear all the time that these are the, the major challenges for some of these companies succeeding. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it's been quite interesting. So over the last few months, there's, there have also been some conversations about whether growth factors, which people do um, speak about a lot in terms of scalability challenges, whether actually when the industry matures and we have appropriate economies of scale, whether growth factors really are the challenge, the, the most challenging component in media. Personally, I don't think we are going to be. But what I do think we, do, we need is a level of innovation now to make sure that we are developing the correct components for ready for scale. So, so for instance, we can adapt growth factors we can keep their natural sequence but we can adapt them to remove some of the sort of natural control mechanisms that act well in the human body but don't want to act well in a bioreactor to improve their functionality so so by combining innovation in growth factors with cell line development so developing cells which are deliberately require less growth factor mm -hmm. And combining, you know, intelligent manufacturing scale up. Now, I'm, I think jury is still out whether a microbial fermentation system, which is what we use here at QCAN, we do everything in animal-free uh, microbial fermentation, or one of the newer expression systems, or one of the actually the, the original expression systems around plant expression, molecular farming. Whether we're, I'm, I'm fairly agnostic over what the final scaled-up production scenario is. 
But at the moment, the industry needs to really focus on deciding what to scale as much as how to scale it. We, we Our innovations, a lot of our innovations are actually expression system agnostic because they're to do with the core functionality of the proteins themselves. There seems to be a trend towards specialization and, you know, companies such as extracellular, Maltus, companies like that, and, and obviously yourselves. Some companies, cultivated meat companies, they might have the expertise in-house or they might call upon a company uh, like Qkind. What are the pros and cons of, of either, do you think? So I think collaboration is going to be really important in this industry and however that flavor is now, no pun intended. So, sorry. <laughs> so... I think it's it's entirely feasible that when this industry matures, large providers will want to have control over key parts of their supply chain, so things like growth factor manufacture. And it may well be that they license in or collaborate with providers to, to make sure they build that in-house capacity. The, the other, obviously, option is to source in and build a really strong, credible supply chain. One of the challenges, particularly focused on growth factors there, is there are very few manufacturers of growth factors worldwide. And any industrial process is going to need at least two, two suppliers at all times because just because of supply chain redundancy, which we all learned an awful lot about during COVID. So I think we will have a mixed model. I think I'm hoping we'll start to see more co-location of companies of different types. So the supply chain, even the energy providers co-locating into campus style plants for want of a better, want of a better term to really get the, that efficiency and also to drive sustainability because we don't want to be shipping growth factors around the world in order to be able to, to build a local manufacturing plant. Mm -hmm. Well, we're going to be coming onto the supply chain shortly. Are there any challenges or limitations associated with the use of these products that you're developing? I think there are generally challenges for the industry. So growth, all growth factors weren't created equal. So, so we have what I'd say the simple growth factors. So things like FGF2, IGF1, which are used in most media for cultivated meat production. And they are, from a manufacturing perspective, quite easy to manufacture. So we're already starting to see a number of companies who are specialised in making FGF2 at bulk. That, that's great. It's fantastic. The, the part of the industry where we're starting to see challenges is in the much more complex growth factors. So like the TGF beta families. Now, most of these cultures will require one of the members of that protein family in their culture media. And these are, I, I won't protein geek too much don't worry but these are really interesting proteins because they're they're complex they're dimeric and they have to form a really specific structure in order to be at biologically active so and and that's that's definitely non-trivial and it requires either expression in a mammalian cell culture production system which is not compatible with, with cultivated meat nor could it scale to the, meet the costs needed in cultivated meat or a microbial system like ours. I haven't yet seen any credible demonstrations of production plant, but I hope that that comes. And actually, we're, we're interested in collaborating if anyone wants to work in that sector, because we do think that this is a, a future challenge. One quite sad thing, actually, Nick, is we're also hearing from sort of customers and, and academic collaborators that for some of the growth factors, there are already starting to be quality challenges. So because these are bioactive proteins, you have to be very careful that, you, you, that they are biologically active. Because, for instance, if you look at TGF beta family protein, uh, so active in A, TGF beta 1, TGF beta 3, if they form their complex dimeric structure, beautifully active, one of the most bioactive proteins you can imagine. It, they also exist quite happily as monomers, so without the connection between the two, and they're entirely inactive, or they have very, very low ac activity. But if you're evaluating a supplier, it's actually hard to tell which what what you, what you've got in your tube or what you've got in your tank. So so those sorts of challenges are already starting to impact customers, and 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 I can see that that's one real challenge as we scale is maintaining the the biological the, the sort of cohesive biology within a bioreactor because stem cells themselves or even sort of primary satellite cells they're, they're, they're very delicate biological systems they're not trivial to scale and actually 
having variability within those cell culture media ingredients has a huge impact on the on the cells themselves. So I think maintaining and scaling that biology is going to be a challenge for the industry. And actually, as a supply chain, I think we need to make sure that the supply chain themselves hold themselves accountable for allowing our customers to be and customers and collaborators to be successful. <laughs> Now, I'm going to hold my hands up. I have not tried a cultivated meat product yet. Have you? No, I would love to. I, I'm <laughs> hoping to. Well, there have been some very interesting regulatory approvals recently. So, But if not, I think it's definitely that trip to Singapore is definitely on the cards. It has to be, uh-huh. doesn't it? Well, we're trying Whereabouts, to Where to... would you go, Nick? Are you going to go? I've, I've, I can't wait to taste it, just, uh, mm. just out of curiosity. I mean, if I had the option... Um, to to buy something that was more sustainable that didn't impact animal welfare then it's a no-brainer for me and uh, I think generationally alpha for instance you know they will be making those choices for us it might not be the old fogies like me but this is probably a silly question do the growth factors themselves contribute to the taste and texture of the final product and and are you able to tailor those factors for specific meat types or, or, or consumer preferences Yes, it's a really, really good question. And uh, it's, a, it's a question that's making me think as well, Nick. So theoretically, yes. So one of the examples I'd, I'd, I'd say is there are, so as you grow, say, a stem cell derived cultivated meat product, and some, some cultivated meat products are derived from stem cells, some are derived from primary cells. But as you grow those cells, you can change the growth factors in the media to, for instance, to mature the muscle. Now, within the traditional ag- agriculture, tr- meat trade, maturation of muscle as, as animals age changes flavor. So, so in my simplistic model, yes, I don't think as an industry we're at that point yet. I think there are other things in the media as well which will massively impact the, the taste and the texture, things like lipids and, and, and some of the scaffolding materials we mentioned earlier. So I think it's intriguing. I, I think the industry's still battling with fundamentals at the moment. Well, I, I absolutely think that's the way that we'll mature over time. Mm-hmm. I mean, it is a very, very young industry. I mean, we've seen over the past year or so some criticism of the plant-based sector and those uh, those targets are seemingly being pointed at cultivated meat. I mean, we're, we're just in the early stages here. There's uh, yeah. no cause for alarm. No, I agree. And, and also, actually, you were talking about the next generation. Part of the reason we're doing what we're doing at Qkine and and helping cultivated meat and sort of becoming involved with these collaborations is because it, it is our children's generation that, that this will impact. So, mm-hmm. you know, I just think it's really important that we all, all chip into the science of this as, as much as we can. In fact, one of my personal interests is actually in the cultivated seafood space because I think that from a health perspective and from a a general sustainability perspective, I I think that's going to be absolutely critical. My interest is always in growth factors and we have no clue what growth factors are going to be important for cultivating salmon or, you know, or even some of the very simple crustacea require a different combination. So adding to the fundamental science will hopefully help push forward to that sector. Mm-hmm. Are there any ethical or sustainability concerns related to the use of growth factors? And, and if there are, how are you addressing these or how would you address these? So it's been interesting, actually. Just recently, I've been trying to delve into some of the, the studies, the LCA studies, and uh, you know, you mentioned the UC Davis study and things like that. So to try and understand what the concerns are around sustainability, particularly within microbial expression. So microbial expression has been used for years to manufacture food processing aids and food enzymes, which are how growth fats are classed in, in the supply chain of cultivated meat, very successfully. So for manufacturing additives for foods, for manufacturing you know, and their enzymes to make cheese and things like that. So, so it's a very established, but none of us are sure at the scale at which it's going to be needed and whether things like bioreps are going to be a, a problem. I I think it's not really ethical, but I think as an industry, we just have to be really careful that we're always engaging with consumers and understanding consumer perception and, and pressure group and, and government perception as well. 
what we don't want this industry to do is to fall foul of some of the miscommunication or the the, the lack of communication with consumers that ended up causing with the GMO issues. You know, obviously, you know, we're of the generation where we re- remember Monsanto and all of the, all of that hoo ha. And one of the the things I'm finding really reassuring is when I'm going along to conferences and speaking with people, the series of very sensible engagement with consumers. But then we have, you know, slightly worrying developments like the Italian or a minority of the Italian government starting to speak out against cultivated meat. I think so. I know it's not really an ethical issue around growth factors, but I think that those are sorts of areas we need to be careful of as an industry. <laughs> You know, there's probably a lot of other factors that come into play, mm. especially with uh, with Italy. Now, we, we know that cultivated meat faces some regulatory challenges, and we've seen recently in the past, where are we now? It's uh, July, wasn't it, that we saw those yeah. um, green lights for, for upside foods and good meat. Do the supply chain providers, so companies such as Qkind, do you face the same hurdles? We we Actually, we, ha- we face very interesting hurdles, and it's uh, so the... The companies that are preparing regulatory dossiers are often case, particularly if they're working with an EFSA or the FCA here in the UK, often working maybe a little bit blind and there's a little bit of a grey area around what's needed in terms of risk analysis of the supply chain. So what what we're doing as a company is, is helping to help really define what's necessary within the, the a growth factor. So... That could be anything as making sure that there are no protein tags, which some regulators really, really don't like. What we've seen as a trend over the last few, last year really, as more people are moving towards first regulatory filings, is people are really looking at actually using much more well-defined growth factors where they can be confident that there's no animal components, no allergens, no non wild type protein sequence, so really go and 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 very high purity, so that we can have very clear analytics because it's the clarity of the supply chain is really important at the moment. So we we have similar sort of slightly odd challenges because, as you said, the cultivated meat industry has just grown so rapidly that the regulatory environment and the expectations are, are maturing alongside. So there are some interesting questions for us internally about whether we need to introduce, you know, ISO 22,000, you know, sort of food standards and, and how you work as a high purity money with trying to provide information that's much more classically from a, a, a food background. It, it's not insurmountable. And, and then there's some interesting areas around analytics for the industry. I think that's going to be a, an important area is the, the analytics haven't quite caught up with what we need to be doing at the moment. Mm-hmm. But we're going to focus now, we're going to go back to supply chains. Now, a lot of the companies serving this industry, the cell ag industry, also serve other industries. Is there a danger that they might not be motivated to build a credible supply chain? And what can we do about that? I mean, I, th- I think you've absolutely, absolutely encapsulated one of the risks to this industry, Nick, actually. So the so there are very, sort of focusing just on growth factors to start with, so There are very few growth factor manufacturers globally, um, and most are also working with the biomedical sciences as well. And that and the stem cell based regenerative medicine market, the stem cell therapy market, and indeed using stem cells within drug discovery platforms, they're all and organoids. They're all exploding at the moment, and they all also want to develop fully animal free, fully defined, highly reproducible medias. Now, that's, and as a supplier, you are always wondering whether you put your energies into supporting that industry or the cultivated meat industry, which which has, has that thing that you're not supposed to do as a company, which is it's an industry that's heading towards commoditization. So uh, as, a, as a supply chain and bulk, and, and it, it's, it's, quite interesting i do actually also get pushback from from people i'm working with as well why are you working in cellular agriculture and part of the reason is that because it is young and it is it is it's driving innovation and we can cross across both of those areas and and use similar innovations in both those areas but i think that is going to be a problem and i i really think that building close collaborations between 
all the elements of the supply chain and the cultivator meat companies is the most powerful way of addressing um, any of these challenges. But it is it is a good question. I mean, you know, why would you? Why would you work for in the cellular agriculture supply chain? Yeah, well, there's a there's a lot of companies that are banking on it succeeding, and there's a lot of money that's been put mm. into it. So we shall see. We shall see. Yeah. Certainly, we've seen a hell of a lot of breakthroughs in the past year in yeah. upside and good meat. We didn't. I didn't think that would happen this time last year so soon so and they're just the first they're just the first are we seeing enough engagement with the supply chain and do you see this as a problem i think we might just be starting to see that level of engagement as companies are moving towards more regulatory filings but also we are starting to see the growth of the research base the academic research base what's what's super interesting about the dynamics of the cultivated meat and cultivated fish industry is it's an industry that's developed within biotech companies without really having a, a, a very broad, freely available peer-reviewed literature and, and research base. So what's so with the recent investment in centres of excellence for cell and agriculture research within academic institutes, I think that that's naturally driving more close collaboration with the supply chain providers as well, because we've got people who are looking for innovative um, reagents. And it's often easier for an academic group to collaborate with a company because there's less IP issues and things. Mm-hmm. I, I think collaboration, not, this industry is so huge, nobody can solve this in isolation. And the the collaborations are, are going to be the strength of this industry going forward. So we've got such, thing, such huge challenges to tackle together. Personally, I'd like to see more innovation from the supply chain being proactively communicated into the companies to really input into media optimization. So for instance, there's been some fabulous single cell sequencing publications from Joshua Flack and colleagues. So that's most of it and Bart Post's group, really fantastic information, but mostly still based around human growth factors. So, so those sorts of really quite simple things we can start to address now as an industry with collaboration. Now, you're a UK headquartered company. The UK finds itself in a pretty unique position, given it's probably the only mm. decent thing to come out of Brexit, I would imagine. <laughs> um, <laughs> I said that to someone the other day and nearly got shot down, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> I probably know I'm a good company. I mean, can the UK be globally competitive in the cultivated cultivated meat sector? Do you know, it, I, so there's a couple of interesting areas on that. So one of the things the UK has always been really, really good at is research. So, and we actually have had a lot of the pioneers of stem cell biology have have been working in the UK lab. So we've actually got a very strong, sort of slightly tangential research base in the UK. We've also got a really good history in manufacturing. So I think we're possibly the eighth largest manufacturing organization so we've got some really good things going for the uk underpinning this sector what we've lacked up to date has been government support and advocacy for the industry and we're just starting to see some government investment into this area so that's that so i think that's a really good sign that this industry is moving forwards We've got quite a good talented sort of skills base in the UK for working in this sector from the pharmaceutical companies, you know, in terms of the, the, the automation and the scale up. We've always been very strong in food manufacturing. It's always been one of the UK's really big industries. So I, I think we can be globally competitive. Also, as you mentioned, Brexit, one of the wonderful things or one of the things that may have been positive coming out of Brexit is that the UK Food Standards Agency is has a little bit more flexibility now. So it builds on that credible history of the European Food Standards Agency being accepted as the gold standard of novel food regulations. So that's, that's a super powerful position. And I'm not a regulatory expert, but one of the one of maybe the stumbling blocks of a, of a European regulatory filing is that after acceptance by the the European the EFSA European Food Standards Authority, it then needs to be approved by member organisations and by a certain percentage of member organisations. Now, the UK is in quite a unique position in that it has that background from EFSA, but the ability to actually innovate now 
and have a level of independence. Uh, and I think that might be one of the reasons that we saw the recent submission by LF Farms, didn't we, in Switzerland and in the UK. So what I'd also say, just from personal experience as well, the people working in this industry in the UK are absolutely fantastic. I mean, collaborative, we've got great skills from pharma around media optimization, and, and we're starting to see a real mixing of this industry in the UK. I think I think there's hope that we can contribute on the global stage here. Do you, do you see much appetite from the UK government? I mean, we, we saw what happened last year with the executive order in the USA and what has happened since President Biden's executive order. Do you think the government's doing enough here? I think it started to something. I think that's really good. So we've seen a couple of government non-dilutive grant funding from Innovate UK, so the UK's grant awarding body, go specifically focusing on this area. So that's really positive. And then just recently, it was announced that the £12 million EPSRC, so a government-funded hub, has been announced for UK cellular agriculture manufacturing. So that's led by Marion Ellis down in Bath. That's the largest single investment by the UK government into this sector. We're lucky enough to be one of the project partners on that that grant. And, and I'll, I, I genuinely think that the group of people that's assembling, which covers... We're lucky being quite a small country because we can just pull together the entire country really one place and have and and have a have a conversation, have an open conversation. But I I actually think in order to really have impact, it's going to need some serious investment. And you know, slightly more critically, if you look at the the sustainability impact of cultivating meat or cellular agriculture, should we say so? Things like you know precision fermentation, production of palm oil, and things like that. If you look at that and the impact that could have on future generations, the investment into that sector by the UK government is trivial compared to the investment in things like new battery technologies, where yeah. which one could argue does have a big sustainability impact, but but potentially less less so long term. So I would like to see a bit of a, a balancing and a and concerted effort from public funding to to really push the building a sustainable food industry in the UK. We're going to move to some wrap now questions, Catherine. We talked about that UC Davis report recently before we came on air. I mean, what do you think of the whole farmer grade versus food grade debate when it comes to growth factors? Yeah, do you know, it's a really interesting question. So one, th- so one thing that I'll just be really straight about it, for me, farmer grade and food grade does not mean high and low quality of product that it's often used to food grades often used to describe or to imply a less crude less refined product now bluntly with growth factors that that's not not helpful it's not helpful differentiation between the two so i think within the food grade so for us one of the one of our considerations is how we can take a, a process which is standardized for biotech manufacturing and actually ensure that we bring in the appropriate food regulations for our process to help our customers through their regulatory approvals so now if you're talking about microbial fermentation of growth factors whether you're talking about farmer grade or food grade it's a very similar manufacturing process so, and in order to look at more cost-effective growth factors, which is also implied by the food grade label, we really need to start reaching those economies of scale. Are there any emerging trends or research areas within this field that you find particularly exciting or promising? And then that's a sort of a prelude to my final question. I mean, I, I sort of I mentioned before some of the academic publications that are coming out using techniques such as single cell sequencing to really start to map exactly what we need in terms of the cell culture media conditions to and understanding even basics like which cell types are are actually within that culture. So I think we we are going to have to get to that level of granularity to really be able to optimize culture media. Current culture media recipes are based on. Uh, what what worked years ago and has happened to be of doing developed through academic protocols or through maybe Cho cell and manufacturing the monoclonal antibody industry and things. So they've just evolved over time. We there's really a space for going back to basics and working out what is present in fetal bovine serum, which is what we're all trying to replace, that has the right impact on the cells. So there's some really fundamental science there that, that could catapult change in the industry and 
And that change for me is about getting more efficient biomass production or cell mass production within bioreactors. So that's really interesting seeing sort of really high tech publications coming out of groups like like Most Meets and Mark Post's group. And really excitedly, I'm actually really watching this cultivated seafood space. I think I, I, I just because seafood is, you know, it's got high level. There's some some seafoods. Obviously, you know, overfishing is not very sustainable. Our oceans are incredibly important ecosystems. But things like uh, microplastics and heavy metal accumulation and things. It would be really good to have an alternative to to, to those sort of um, problems that are in already in our food chain. But for me, from a scientist perspective. It's it's totally unknown because we already know that, for instance, a the, the the sort of the conservation of these proteins. So the similarities between the same protein in different species can vary quite a lot. And again, it's not consistent. So you've got some proteins like the TGF beta family proteins where they're highly conserved, but then you've got some proteins like EGFs where there's such differences between species that almost look like different proteins. But we but and then when you take it to fish where there's less sequence annotation of the genome, you've got a whole extra set of challenges, scientific challenges to really build a set of growth factors that will give you optimized production of fish cells. <laughs> I, I think that's going to be really interesting. Are, are you working with any companies in the in this alternative seafood sector? Are you able to tell us that? Because uh, starting... I've, I've written a feature on this particular subject and they're a great bunch of people. Do you know what that? I think that theme is through everybody I've met in this sector, and I think that's what makes it such a joy to work in. Everyone I've met has been absolutely lovely and just in, just really driven to do the best they can in this sector. So we're just starting to talk to people in the cultivated seafood and particularly the bony fish sector. Although I was having an interesting conversation about whether whether we should be trying to make shark and things from I think you know all sorts of, of, of weird and wonderfuls, but it's it's certainly an interesting area. I, I would say though we we don't have a set of growth factors for bovine yet in terms of like as an industry we're still using a mix and match between human and and um, and some porcine and some bovine so so i think before we move into some of these more complex species we probably also need to sort out bovine space as well mm-hmm. and finally catherine dr catherine elton could you share okay. your perspective on the future of growth factors in cultivated meat production and how this might evolve in the coming years and and also more generally the future for cultivated meat so I don't think I'd be sitting here chatting with you if I didn't believe that cultivated meat could get to the market in the next 10 years or so. I I genuinely think it's it's one of the ways that we can build food security in, in the future and also overcome some of the health issues around uh, antibiotic resistance and, as we've talked about, contamination things and, and be more sustainable. So I'm a, a big advocate for the space. I do think it will succeed. I feel... We may have a sort of a back to basics for for a few for a couple of years where we have first regulatory filings, and then we need to translate those processes into more scalable processes. So I think there's going to be a real drive for innovation over the next five years, and for growth factors in particular, what I would love to see is we rapidly innovate and iterate to identify the correct set of growth factors to give us the characteristics that we want for scalable growth in bioreactors. And then we look at how, as manufacturers in the supply chain, we, we feel accountable to then working out how that those those correct growth factors can then be scaled effectively in a sustainable manner. And 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 to be quite honest, we we're very good at that innovation phase. And then we're actually fairly expression system agnostic because a lot of that protein innovation can be applied into, for instance, plant molecular farming or some of the really interesting hydroponics-based plant expression systems that are just becoming, or or even some of the, like the Drosophila systems and things, you know. So, so I think we, we need to come together, these smaller companies that are supporting this, this supply chain and, and combine our expertise and innovations to really push things forwards. And then as we scale, I would like to celebrate because I, I think we'll have achieved, we'll have overcome some rather significant mild hurdles to get to scale. Yeah. Well, the beers will be on me. Catherine, thank you very much for your time this afternoon. It's been fascinating. You've somehow managed to turn a very complex 
topic into something that was very digestible anyway for me. I'm sure our readers won't have the same trouble, but thank you very much for your time.